Today, we're taking a look at the Armstrong Whitworth Siskin. The Siskin was the company's most successful aircraft from the interwar period. And interestingly, it was also their first design of the interwar period as well. It was produced as a frontline fighter for RAF squadrons, and it would earn a reputation for both reliability and superb handling, with much of its public fame coming from the annual RAF displays, particularly the one held at Hendon. In fact, a majority of its time featured in the aviation press was due to the various stunts that its pilots performed. Some were fairly routine, others were deeply terrifying, and these all highlighted the aircraft's remarkable and nimble nature, something that is of course highly prized in a military fighter. Eventually, just under 500 aircraft would be built over two major variants and a smattering of sub-variants, which is a surprisingly large number for post-war Britain, whose early 1920s aerial policy could best be summed up in one word, austerity. The Siskin was successful for a couple of reasons, its brilliant handling notwithstanding, but a major point was the fact that it was the RAF's first fighter aircraft that utilised an all-metal structure. This would dramatically improve the aircraft's longevity, and it would stay in service until the early 1930s, which for the time was a remarkable feat, considering its design origins can be traced back to 1917. It was originally conceived as the Siddeley DZ SR2. This aircraft was meant to be powered by a new engine that was being designed by engineers Samuel Heron and Major F.M. Green, who had recently moved to the company after working for the Royal Aircraft Factory. They were in the process of designing and testing a new twin-row 14-cylinder radial engine, which was hoped to produce more than 300 horsepower and to deliver superior fuel efficiency. This would of course provide a new fighter aircraft with superior performance and range, and the Air Ministry placed an order for six of these aircraft in early 1918. This order would be quickly cut down to just three following the armistice in November, and it was further hampered by engine development problems. There was not an issue with the new radial engine per se, but more of a question of program priority. Development of this engine had been sidelined in favour of the Siddeley Puma, which was the six-cylinder inline engine that was powering the Airco DH-9. Because of this, it was then decided to switch the engine of the SR-2 over to the ABC Dragonfly, which was a nine-cylinder radial. This engine also happened to be the subject of the first aircraft specification that was issued by the newly formed RAF. The RAF was very keen on the Dragonfly. According to its designer, Granville Bradshaw, it was supposedly easy to build, cheap to build, would develop a healthy 340 horsepower, and thanks to newfangled copper plate cooling fins, its heat dissipation was so good that water would supposedly not boil on the surface of the radiators. Yeah, that wasn't the case as it turned out. During testing, the engine got so hot that the cylinder heads glowed a deep red at operational speeds, it was overweight, it was underpowered, and most hilariously, the engine's optimal running speed matched the resonance frequency of its own crankshaft, so it was a loud, hot, vibrating nightmare of a thing that had an average service life of just 30 hours. To make matters worse, the predicted performance of the Dragonfly had been so good that the RAF had ordered over 1,000 of these things, and production of all other aero engines, except for the Rolls-Royce Eagle, had been cancelled throughout 1918 in favour of the ABC Dragonfly. Had the war carried on past November 1918, it might have been a particularly awkward situation for the RAF. And so, with an engine about as stable as the country's finances, the Siskin made its first flight in 1919, and then it didn't really make another appearance until 1921, when it re-emerged with an engine that was actually of some use, the Armstrong Siddeley Jaguar, which had evolved from the original engine the aircraft had been designed to take. It was also now known as the Armstrong Whitworth Siskin, after Armstrong and Siddeley Deasy had merged in 1920. Despite the Dragonfly engine being a complete disaster, the Siskin had actually handled very well in its first tests in 1919, and it then performed even better when equipped with the Jaguar engine. 
In consequence of this, the Air Ministry wanted Armstrong Whitworth to develop the type for mainline production, but the RAF, who wanted their next fighter to be considerably more sturdy and long-lasting, stipulated that they would only accept a fighter design with all-metal structure. Major Green offered to redesign the Siskin with this in mind, and an order was placed for a prototype in 1920. Before the prototype was built, another Siskin was built with mixed construction as a sort of test bed to make sure that the engineers had a handle on the new construction method. This aircraft, known as the Siskin Mark II, had an all-metal structure for the fuselage, but still used wood for the wings and the tail surfaces. Developed privately by the company, it held a civil registration, and it was entered into the King's Cup air races of 1922 and 1923. It was forced to retire from the 1922 race, but it won the cup in 23, averaging a speed of 148.7 miles an hour, or roughly 239 kilometers an hour. Though it looked about as sleek as a brick, the Siskin II was one of the best performing aircraft yet flying, and following the race it was shown off at various exhibits in Britain and in Europe. Sweden ended up taking considerable interest in the Siskin, and they ordered a single export copy of the aircraft so that they could compare it to various other types in their inventory. Meanwhile, the all-metal prototype ordered by the RAF was completed in the spring of 1923, and it flew for the first time on May the 7th. Known as the Siskin Mark III, it was a remarkably blocky but well-performing Cessna plane. Characteristic features of the design were the narrow lower wing, a slab-sided fuselage, an uncowled engine, and the angled interplane struts. Following its initial flight, the early flight tests of the Siskin Mark III proved to be enormously promising. The RAF had asked Armstrong Whitworth for a sturdy design, and Major Green and his design team had certainly delivered. The wing structure had been designed in such a way that if one of the bracing wires should be shot away or fail in another circumstance, the load could still be managed by the rest. Additionally, the wings were braced in such a way that if one of the interplane struts could be shot away in combat, the wing itself would not collapse without its support. This, combined with the new Olea struts for the undercarriage, which made landing considerably more bearable, and the all-metal airframe, made the Siskin all round a very sturdy design. And this was not only important from the point of aerial combat, but also from a training perspective as well, as it meant it would be a lot more forgiving to handle for newer pilots. Following a successful evaluation, the RAF placed an initial order for three production Siskins to be used for service testing, and providing all was well, further orders would soon follow. The first production aircraft flew in March of 1924, and in fact by that point, follow-up orders had already been placed. The only notable difference between the prototype Siskin III and the early production models was a new type of tapered aileron, which replaced the original square cut units, which showed a bit of a worrying tendency to jam up in high angle dives. Within two months of the first production Siskin being completed, the RAF began to take delivery of its first units, with number 41 squadron at Northolt being the first to receive them. Initial deliveries began in late May of 1934, and in the following year the squadron had enough to make a full public appearance at the RAF display at Hendon. Number 11 squadron was the next to re-equip with the type, taking delivery in June, and one of their Siskins was then sent back the following year for experimental testing of a supercharged Jaguar IV engine. The testing proved successful, and this aircraft was then returned to the squadron four months later, and over the course of the next six months, all of the other squadron's aircraft were also converted over to the supercharged Jaguar IV. The supercharger made minimal impact below altitudes of 10,000 feet, but it dramatically improved performance above that. And so, following their conversions, 111 Squadron would become the RAF's first high-altitude fighter unit. They pioneered high-altitude combat maneuvers and navigation, and also made extensive use of early single-seat fighter oxygen systems. In total, 118 of the Siskin 3s would be built before things switched over to the Siskin 3A. Of those 118, approximately 49 were built as the two-seat Siskin Mark 3D, which was a training variant. Two others were later sent to the Royal Canadian Air Force for evaluation, who later purchased them. Two more went to Estonia for the same purpose, and two were retained by Armstrong Whitworth as flight trainers. 
The Siskin 3A would be the most produced model of the lot, and it was developed from the fifth production aircraft, which had been taken from the factory and kept aside for development. It differed from the Mark III in several ways. Notably, the rear section of the fuselage was raised further up, the ventral section of the tail fin had been deleted, and the supercharged Jaguar IV engine was fitted as standard. In service, the Mark III-A was equipped with two forward-firing 303 caliber Vickers machine guns, which had approximately 600 rounds per gun, and it had underwing racks to carry up to four small 20-pound bombs. With its supercharged engine, the Siskin 3A had a service ceiling of 27,100 feet, which was a significant improvement, as the average before this was around 15,000. And at 10,000 feet, it was good for a top speed of 153 miles an hour, or approximately 246 kilometers an hour. The first squadron to re-equip with the Mark 3A would be number 111 squadron. And just as they were the first to pioneer high-altitude fighter training techniques with the standard Mark III's, they would now pioneer new practices for communication, as well as night fighting tactics, courtesy of new and improved two-way radio transmitters that were installed in all Mark III-A's as standard. In the following year, three more squadrons would take delivery of the Mark III-A, number 41 in March, number 1 in August, and number 56 in September, and these were followed in 1927 and in 1928 by numbers 29, 32, 43, and 17 Squadron. Despite its rough looks, which made the Siskin appear to be a cumbrous machine, it was in fact very manoeuvrable, and it was well liked by its pilots for its nimble handling and reliability. The training variant, the Mark III-D, was highly praised for its sturdiness, especially during takeoff and landing, and its high altitude performance opened the way for a whole new type of aerial doctrine, that of the high altitude interceptor. The Siskin's high maneuverability meant that many of the RAF squadrons would use the aircraft for their annual aerobatic displays. Number 43 Squadron in particular made a name for itself with the Siskin. Pilots were so confident that their aircraft were both manoeuvrable and stable enough that they would tie three of them together and fly them through various aerobatic routines. Sometimes they did this at moderately high altitude, sometimes they did it at astonishingly low altitude, which was a considerable crowd pleaser, but not something I imagine we could probably get away with today. Though the Siskin was popular in the RAF, and although Armstrong Whitworth had launched a display tour in Europe, trying to sell it to France, Belgium, and numerous other Eastern European customers, the only major operator of the type outside of Britain would be Canada. There had been an order placed with Romania for 65 export models, but that at one point was cancelled after only two had been delivered. The reason for the cancellation of this order has always been a bit of a mystery. Some claimed that it was the result of one of the Siskins that was being flown by their test pilots at the time crashing, and others claimed that it was due to French influence, as the French were trying to get aircraft exported to Romania as well, and some subtle backroom manoeuvring had secured an order for their aircraft over those coming out of Britain. Ultimately though, the true answer might never really be known. Canada, on the other hand, was determined to get some of these Siskins from the start. Following the assessment of two Mark III Siskins in 1926, the Royal Canadian Air Force placed orders for the improved Mark III-A. Some of these would be produced and sent directly to Canada from Armstrong Whitworth production lines, and some of the others were second-hand airframes from the RAF. The Siskin quickly became popular with Canadian pilots, and following a couple of air shows, it became even more popular with the general public. Two of them would perform with distinction in the US National Air Races held in 1929 in Cleveland, and an aerobatic team would travel to various cities throughout Canada between 1930 and 1921, performing various stunts and displays, some of which involved performing very tight loops at very low altitudes, to the point where the wings were mere feet from the grass. Happily, no accidents actually occurred during these events, and the Siskin was thus declared to be the best single-engine fighter flying in Canada at the time, a distinction it would hold for a number of years. By 1931, after many years of peaceful, albeit boring service, which was sometimes interrupted by the occasional Daredevil air show, the Siskin was now being operated in a variety of units within the RAF. 
Some were frontline fighter squadrons, some were training units, others were in communication and liaison units, whereas others were in special gunnery schools. But by this point, the type was beginning to feel its age, and following the abortive attempt to improve the design into the Mark III-B, which was heavier, slower, and had an endurance of less than one hour, which made it basically impractical as a fighter, it was decided to gradually phase the Siskin out of service. By the end of 1932, most of the RAF Siskins had been retired, bringing an end to a career that was dotted with landmark achievements, but was, from a military perspective, peaceful and dull. Still, the Siskin had earned itself a good reputation. It was the first all-metal fighter to be operated by the RAF in quantity. It was also the first to make full use of a two-way radio for regular communications, as well as nighttime operations, in large numbers. And it bridged a painful period in British aeronautics. Between 1919 and 1924, the aviation industry in Britain fought for its very survival. And during that time, barely any decent fighter aircraft survived beyond the drawing board. The Siskin had given the RAF a solid and reliable machine during a time when it really couldn't afford to be picky. Like many other aircraft of its time, it's not particularly well known as it never saw combat, but had it been required to go to war during its prime, it probably would have done itself credit. This successful but inglorious fate was something that the Siskin would share with its successor, the Bristol Bulldog. At least to some degree, the Bulldog actually saw some limited combat service overseas, but the story of the Bulldog is one for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patrons. Uh, now I know I promised part two of the Douglas video to be out this weekend, but unfortunately, <clears throat> unfortunately my uh, cough is still lingering around, which is a... Uh, delayed the final bits of my editing process because there were a few sections of the video that I had to re-record and I'm struggling to actually re-record those sections because it is very difficult to speak for long sentences right now so please bear with me. It should hopefully be up uh, at some point next week. Um, there's going to be no videos until then because I literally just can't record stuff right now. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members. And for those of you wondering how this video has been uploaded today if I can't record audio, this video was actually done a while ago and it's in my backup folder. I have backups for this very reason. Now I'm going to go and drink my body weight in tea and try and get my voice back to some semblance of normality and hopefully I can continue to record long segment videos. But as always thank you all for your continued support and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.